Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, there's still some people streaming in, but I think we can get moving here. Uh, so welcome everybody to the first of our Schumacher Conversations. Uh, so the 50th anniversary of E.F. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, uh, is upon us in 2023. And we see this as our opportunity to advance solutions to today's social, economic, and environmental cha challenges. Um, and we're hosting a, a series of monthly conversations that are building on Schumacher's original vision. And so there'll be one each month um, we'll share a link to that calendar. It was posted on the screen before, uh, where we're bringing together change makers whose work today is actively shaping a small is beautiful future, uh, organized around 12 uh, key themes and fields of activism. Today, our first lecture is on reimagining economics for a thriving world. And we have three guests with us today, John Fullerton, Ruth Potts, and Stuart Wallace. Um, I'll introduce each of them uh, before they share some of their remarks around Small is Beautiful. Um, but I actually wanted to just start us off with actually um, a quick uh, reading from Small is Beautiful. I was uh, happy to see that John and I have the same edition. Uh, Stuart has the original one, so that was exciting to see. Um, and it's great to look back at this book actually and see the notes uh, and comments that I wrote in the margins um, about 15 years ago when I first read it. And uh, John and I were just talking about, uh, you know, how you have that opportunity to, to do that at the Schumacher Library. So another uh, shout out would be to please check out the centerforneweconomics.org and learn about the collection of books that they have there and opportunities for having access to them. Um, so, um, Here's one passage from Small is Beautiful that I thought would kind of set the tenor for the day. And then uh, from there, I'll go in alphabetical order and uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, so here, this is from Small is Beautiful. The hope that the pursuit of goodness and virtue can be postponed until we have attained universal prosperity and that by the single-minded pursuit of wealth without bothering our heads about spiritual and moral questions, we could establish peace on earth is an unrealistic, unscientific, and irrational hope. The exclusion of wisdom from economics, science, and technology was something which we could perhaps get away with for a little while, as long as we were relatively unsuccessful. But now that we have become very successful, the problem of spiritual and moral truth moves into the central position. From an economic point of view, the central concept of wisdom is permanence. We must study the economics of permanence, Nothing makes economic sense unless it is continuance for a long time can be projected without running into absurdities. There can be growth towards a limited objective, but there cannot be unlimited generalized growth. It is more than likely, as Gandhi said, that earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not for every man's greed. Permanence is incompatible with a predatory attitude which rejoices in the fact that what were luxuries for our fathers have become necessities for us. The cultivation and expansion of needs is the antithesis of wisdom. It is also the antithesis of freedom and peace. Each increase of needs tends to increase one's dependence on outside forces over which one cannot have control and therefore increases existential fear. Only by a reduction of needs can one promote a genuine reduction in the tensions which are the ultimate causes of strife and war. The economics of permanence implies a profound reorientation of science and technology, which have to open their doors to wisdom, and in fact, have to incorporate wisdom into their very structure. Science or technological solutions, that's in quotations, which poison the environment or degrade the social structure and the man himself are of no benefit, no matter how brilliantly conceived or how great their superficial attraction. Ever bigger machines entailing ever bigger concentrations of economic power and exerting ever greater violence against the environment do not represent progress. They are a denial of a wisdom, denial of wisdom, and wisdom demands a new orientation of science and technology toward the organic, the gentle, the nonviolent, the elegant, and beautiful. So uh, with that, I couldn't agree more. He was right 50 years ago. <laughs> He's right now. Uh, and very excited to have these uh, three wonderful and accomplished uh, people with us today um, sharing their thoughts. And as I mentioned, to begin in alphabetical order, uh, we'll start with John Fullerton. 
Uh, John is the founder and president of the Capital Institute and is a former managing director at JP Morgan, where he worked for 18 years. Subsequently, he was seed investor and CEO of an energy infrastructure focused investment management company. He's the author of the wonderful book, Regenerative Capitalism, How Universal, How Universal Principles and Patterns Will Shape the New Economy. And as the principal of Level 3 Capital Advisors, he is also a recognized impact investment practitioner, uh, and he's a great guy. So without further ado, uh, John, I'll pass it off to you. And, and you're on mute. Well, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I, I, um, I didn't prepare to have to be the, um, the person who follows E.F. Schumacher giving a talk. So uh, that was, um, that pretty much said everything that, that I could say. And um, um, uh, I'll see if I, can, if I can pick it up from there. Um, first of all, it's really wonderful to be here, uh, to be invited to this. I, I have a special place in my heart for not only E.F. Schumacher, the man who I never was fortunate enough to meet, but for the, the Schumacher Center, uh, for Susan Witt in particular. Um, and I'll share a little story about that, but um, it's, it's really an honor to, um, to be contributing to this event. And, and isn't it interesting, this year is the 50th anniversary of Small is Beautiful. Last year was the 50th anniversary of Limits to Growth. And um, so something must have been in the water 50 years ago. And um, in, in many ways, it's, um, it's terrifying to think how little has really changed since these profound, in fact, I would say those two books are two of maybe four books that were the source of my real epiphany. Um, and if the fact that they were written 50 years ago, which means that that thinking existed 60 years ago, and we're where we are today is, is obviously a bit discouraging. Um, but the good news is that they're no longer, um, you know, in the fringes. I think these ideas are, are very much central in, in, um, in, in almost any conversation about world events. Uh, to varying degrees, and so I guess we we should be pleased with that progress. I was taught in my education about how living systems or how systems change is that they only change in response to pressure. So the difference between today and 50 years ago is that there's exponentially more pressure um, pushing to shift the system. So I think it would be a, a grave mistake to think that the pace of change over the last 50 years is going to resemble anything uh, over the next 50 years, or frankly, even five years. I think we're in the midst of extreme and rapid change, and, and, um, and that's obviously um, disconcerting as well. But it's a, but it's a very hopeful uh, and important phase that we've entered. Um, but before I, I, I kind of um, share a little bit of, of my own thoughts in, in the short time we have, I thought I would just share a story of, on how I uh, first came to E.F. Schumacher's work and, uh, and, the, and the Schumacher Library. Um, it was not too long after my departure from Wall Street, I was in a sense wandering in the wilderness and someone recommended Schumacher to me. I honestly don't remember who it was, but this would have been back in maybe 2006 or seven. And, um, and I read Small is Beautiful and I loved it. And then I read, um, and I do have the same same edition and it was fun to go back today and reread what I hadn't looked at probably in at least 10 years um, and, and probably since I, I first read it. But also I must say that the book that really grabbed me was uh, what I believe was his final published book, A Guide for the Perplexed. And it grabbed me in part because I was perplexed and needed a guide and so if you were to compare the notes in the back of the two books, the guide for the perplexed, I don't know if you can see it, but I've got three pages of notes um, in the back of this short little book and, and tons of underlines and notes in this book. But um, these, these two books together um, uh, absolutely were foundational to uh, what's become my life's work. And, and they had such a profound effect. I literally got in my car 
and drove up to Massachusetts uh, and, and cold called the Schumacher Center, knocked on the door and introduced myself and Susan greeted me. And when I explained to her that I was a banker that was thinking about all this stuff, she, she sort of shoved me aside with one of the staff that was there at the time. And, and we had a great conversation about money, but I've become um, good friends with Susan. And in fact, Susan and I traveled to London and met with Stuart in the early days of, um, of a reincarnation of, of, uh, of the work that Neff was doing. And so anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a great reunion that, that we're all having here. And, and of course I met Matthew since then and have been to Schumacher College since then, although before Ruth was there. So it's, it's really a fun reunion for me. And when I was thinking about what, what I can say about E.F. Schumacher in, in five minutes, um, um, that what, there's, there's two things. One is Susan kindly invited me to write a, a paper on E.F. Schumacher. And that became, um, I think it was published in about 2008. And that became, in a sense, my coming out of the closet paper. It was the first time that I publicly said a bunch of the things I was thinking and learning and, and struggling and, and, and whatnot. And that, and the Schumacher Center published that paper. Um, it's on the Schumacher website. It's on my website. And I, I reread that um, prior to this uh, event. And it, it, you know, it's, it's dated, it's not great, but it, um, it shows you how profound Schumacher's thinking was on my own thinking. Um, and the other thing I did is I, I went in and, and just, again, browsed through the book in a very organic way. And uh, as these things happened, landed on, first I wanted to go back and reread Buddhist economics. And so when I opened Buddhist economics, the first thing I have underlined on the opening two pages of it is the following sentence. Uh, and it struck me as one of the important things I'd like to share. Economists themselves, like most specialists, normally suffer from a kind of metaphysical blindness assuming that theirs is a science of absolute and invariable truths without any pre presuppositions. And this, um, uh, this metaphysical blindness, I would say, has been um, at the heart of my work um, and my search and my um, effort to reconnect, to remember economics with metaphysical reality. And metaphysical reality is a big, a mouthful, and it's something that um, I would venture to guess that most people in positions of power, whether they're in government, business, or the, um, uh, the various social sectors, um, are not, their education is not up to speed on our latest understanding of metaphysical reality. Most importantly, our understanding of how living systems work but it actually goes beyond that. It's our understanding of, of, of physics and, um, uh, and the, the, the latest understanding of how, how life on this planet, frankly, how life in this universe exists. And if, we're, if the economy is, this, in a sense, now the water we're swimming in because it permeates everything, and yet the economy, the system design of the economy is in conflict with the metaphysical reality that we actually now understand, how is it possible that we could end up with outcomes that are healthy? And that, that's essentially the basis of, or that's the premise of my work on regenerative economics. Um, regenerative, regeneration is the literal process of how living systems work. And so the idea is to get clear on what are the first principles, what are the patterns, what are the qualities of how living systems work and see how they align and don't align with how our economy is organized and use them as our guide or our compass to, um, to redesign, reorganize uh, our economic thinking um, and, um, and the necessary guardrails and rules and, and whatnot that go around them. But until we're clear on that metaphysical reality, we don't know what our, we don't know what we're, uh, what we're searching for. And, um, uh, and it was fascinating to me to find that literally that sentence was the first sentence I read when I went back to reread Schumacher. And the second thing I landed on just totally randomly happened to be 
the uh, beginning of the of part two of the book, Small is Beautiful. Part two is called Resources. And the first chapter in Resources is called The Greatest Resource Dash Education. And isn't it interesting that I've chosen um, to create to focus on education and to create a course on regenerative economics, um, rather than to try to, you know, solve the problems, move into action. I, I think all of the action that we're all trying to do is totally important and natural and to be expected and build a model and replicate it. All that stuff is critical. But um, I do believe that um, if we rush to action before we, in a sense, re-educate ourselves about metaphysical reality, our actions will lead to, you know, either lack of success that we that we meant to achieve, or additional, you know, will create problems that that become the, you know, the the problem solving we seek to do will become the future problems that we'll need to solve in the future. Um, so again, I hope we'll turn this into a dialogue, but I just want to leave everyone with really those two thoughts. One. Um, one being that this is a metaphysical reality crisis that we're in, and we need to remember and reconnect with the metaphysical reality that we now understand, which, by the way, has been understood uh, for thousands of years. It's, 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 it's remarkable and overwhelmingly uh, profound how aligned our latest science is with our earliest um, uh, indigenous and, and um, spiritual wisdom. Um, I love the fact that Schumacher's work is very spiritual. Um, I had the opportunity to spend the night in the library there reading through his library. And I remember commenting to Susan Witt once how most, of, not most, but many of the books there are philosophical and spiritual more than uh, scientific or, or certainly economic. Um, so at any rate, so two points. One is that, that we're in a metaphysical reality crisis and we need to get clear on reality and then align our economy with that. And secondly, the importance of education and let's call it re-education, um, not just for young people, although importantly for young people, um, but for anybody in a position of power, if they're to move, um, uh, if they're to align their actions with the direction that will actually address the, the challenges that we face in this moment. So I'll leave it at that. Is that Am I inside my time limit, Matt? You're, you're perfect. Thank okay. you. Actually, really great. Um, before we move forward, there was one question um, from the audience. You mentioned uh, A Guide for the Perplexed and Small is Beautiful as being two profound books. You also mentioned Limits to Growth by Danilo Meadows. I'm wondering, uh, you, you said there were four books. Uh, <laughs> What, what are those? Are those three of the four or and what's the fourth? You know, I, 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 I want to hesitate to answer this only because the books I don't mention will be unfairly um, uh, maligned because there were many. But if I had to, uh, I will say there, if I had to pick one more, it would be Herman Daly's um, For the Common Good. Um, but I could, I could list, in fact, I have to update it, but our website has probably a hundred books on it that were influential and um, I should update it, but um, uh, I, I'll just share with you what I'm reading right now, which is just blowing my mind all over again, um, which is this, The Cosmic Hologram uh, by Jude Caravan, and uh, sorry, Jude Curavan, um, who's, a, who's a physicist and cosmologist. And uh, this is an onion that the more layers you peel back, the, the deeper and richer it gets. Great, thank you, John. Um, next, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Ruth Potts uh, here today. Uh, Ruth is the head of regenerative economics at Schumacher College, College in Devon. Uh, she is a researcher, facilitator, artist, and activist who works for the Common Cause Foundation on a project exploring values in media. She was previously a senior advisor on the Green New Deal in the office of the Green, Green, of the Green Member of Parliament, Carolyn Lucas. So Ruth, thank you for being with us today and um, welcome. Uh, you're muted too, I think. Yes, it's, um, yes, 
Thank you so much. I'm absolutely stuck on mute, but not anymore. Absolutely delighted um, to be here with you all um, and honoured to be here alongside um, alongside Stuart and alongside John and alongside um, colleagues at the Schumacher Centre. Um, we were asked to, to say something about the influence of, of Schumacher's Small is Beautiful on our work. Um, well, in, in some ways, Schumacher's Small is Beautiful has, has influenced at least 20 years of my working life first at the New Economics Foundation and now Schumacher College, both members of the Schumacher Work Circle and um, places deeply um, influenced by Schumacher's thinking and writing. Um, and echoing really both what John and Matthew have said, I think what strikes you when you reread Small is Beautiful today is the dense and vibrant mix of philosophy, of environmentalism and of economics. And also it's bold idealism. Schumacher is not somebody whose thinking is bounded by what already exists. He asks more, um, what should we um, be aiming for? It's a book of bold imaginative speculation and we need much more of that kind of thing um, to meet the challenges of the times that we're living through today. Um, so, 50 years on, what we, what we know probably is that Schumacher was right. Um, scale does matter enormously. Um, and we also know that we need much more of the bold imaginative thinking that Schumacher set out um, in Small is Beautiful. So what, what I wanted to do um, with the short time that I have to share some thoughts is to set out some of the ways in which I think Schumacher was right. Um, I think he was right on scale. I think he was right on the importance of ownership, and I think he was right about what work could be. Um, I want to acknowledge his profound depth, um, debt to Gandhi um, and our um, unpaid and ongoing colonial debt to the Global South. Um, and I want to share finally um, some of the things that I think Schumacher would be excited about um, were he with us today. Um, but, but looking back, I think John's explained how influential Small is Beautiful was to him. We've, 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 we're here to celebrate the book, but I think it's, it's easy to forget just how influential it was. It was one of the Times Higher Education's um, 100 most influential books of the century. It was read by millions of people. So this, what, what Schumacher brought to the public conversation and to public consciousness was these questions of was these questions of, of scale. And I think I think what what happened um, and perhaps um, why we're not living in the world that Schumacher might have envisaged we envisaged we would be living fifty years on is that small became cool. Um, but rather than transforming our economic system, it was taking up as a part of a branding strategy, which masked the ongoing concentration of power um, in political and economic power um, through the, the uh, references and the articulation of the small and the particular. Um, and I think, um, I think it's something that we all need to be aware of with our work today. Um, if the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, the... Um, the duty of um, radical economic thinkers is to always be alert to the way in which good ideas may be co-opted um, and to hold those uh, um, to account who do. So in terms of the way that small is taken up, we, we have um, HSBC, one of the world's largest banks, promoting itself as a local bank. Amazon provide your local delivery driver um, if you're in the US. Um, probably a significant proportion of the food you eat um, has passed through Walmart stores at some point at some point. So in some ways giganticism which the giganticism which Schumacher um, warned us of has triumphed um, but small is on the rise again too and I think in that we can um, we can find uh, we can find grounds for enormous hope. And in saying that I think it's also um, important to remember that Small is Beautiful wasn't even what Schumacher wanted to call the book. Um, if his great work on, on rethinking economics had been called the principles of the subsidiarity function, it might have been a more representative um, articulation of Schumacher's ideas, but it probably wouldn't have reached the millions who were touched by Small is Beautiful. 
Schumacher wasn't interested in small per se, he was interested in appropriate scale. And not only appropriate scale, but also democratic ownership. One of the things that struck me rereading for, for rereading for today's conversation was the real emphasis he pay, he played on um, placed on participation. Um, so when he talks about nationalized industries, he's clear to argue that nationalization doesn't necessarily need to be nationwide, but rather a collaboration of or collaborative of smaller democratically controlled enterprises. Um, he accepts the value of small private enterprise, but according to Schumacher, large scale enterprise in large scale enterprise, private ownership is a fiction for the purpose of enabling functionless owners to live parasitically on the labors of others. And I don't think we have to think too hard for examples of that today. So think again of Amazon, of Walmart, of Facebook, all delivering private affluence and public squalor. Um, and this giganticism that, that Schumacher warned us about has left us alienated and alone with rising levels of inequality, lower levels of trust and community and increased loneliness and depression. But what and what big can't provide, I think, and this is, I think, Schumacher's fundamental insight, which I think John spoke to to a degree, is that what Schumacher instinctively re recognized was the value of relationship. And what scale does is brings us into contact with the human, with one another, with the natural world we're part of. It puts us into touch with the consequences of our actions and brings us into relationships of care and maintenance. And this spills over into the realm of work too. One of the recurrent themes in the book is how modern organizations strip the satisfaction out of work, making the worker no more than an anonymous cog in a huge machine. Skill was no longer um, important and nor was the quality of human relationship. And um, so in the in the era of the gig economy, I see we I think we can see how that has has gone even further today. But for Schumacher, drawing on the Buddhist thought that John mentioned, work should be part of the good life itself. So through work, we find the cultivation of to Schumacher, we find the cultivation of friendship Um Good work in, in, enables us to enjoy the arts. We're able to participate usefully. We're able to care for others. Um, the pursuit of self-fulfillment happens through uh, the realm of work and the realm of realm of civic civic participation. Even um, so, for Schumacher, the purpose of the economy there was enabling the fulfillment of others. Um, where th these are the examples of the things that really matter, not the acquisition of goods beyond basic needs. Um, again, um, Schumacher was clear about the impossibility, as, as John has pointed out, clear about the impossibility of endless economic growth on a finite planet and its undesirability. He was interested in an economics of qualities, not quantity. Um, and he referred to what, what the activist Greta Thunberg has more recently called the fairy fairy tale of endless economic growth. Um, so Schumacher was was ahead of his time. The thinking is still um, valid today, and I think it's really important as well to acknowledge some of the roots of Schumacher's thinking. So the thinking set out in Smalling is beautiful was deeply inspired by Gandhi, and by the work of the Indian Indian economist J C Kumrappa. Um, in 1955, Schumacher spent three months as an economic advisor in Myanmar, now then Burma, um, where under the influence of Gandhi, he became radically critical of the effects of Western-led development on traditional culture. In the 60s, he spent time again lecturing in India, and by now he was acutely critical of the style of development that was then being promoted by um, the Bretton Woods Creative World Bank and based on expensive grand projects. So he sought to promote use of simpler, less expensive, locally controlled technologies. Um, and with George McRoby in 1965, set up the Intermediate Technology Development Group, still working today as practical action. So this was human scale development, not the extractive development that effectively continued colonialism through economic means. Um, there are emissions in Schumacher's work, of course. I think it's odd, given his emphasis on relationship, 
that he doesn't address the economics of care um, more centrally. All of that activity, which largely takes place outside of the realms of the formal economy, the way in which we care for one another, bringing up children, caring for the elderly, um, the domestic labour that falls outside the realm of the market. I think that's something that um, that Schumacher overlooked, perhaps, in his, um, in his focus of the stuffiness, the materiality of the economy. Um, and were Schumacher to be with us today, we, we might expect that he might also acknowledge and he did acknowledge his, um, his intellectual and practical debt to Gandhi, but we might expect him to also acknowledge the colonial debt owed by the UK to India. And recent calculations by the economist Utsa Patnaik has um, shown that, that um, around 45 trillion was siphoned out of India over 200 years um, by Britain. Over Britain's, the time of Britain's colonial rule, life expectancy dropped by 20% and increased by 70% post-independence. So in very important ways, Britain didn't develop India at all. India um, developed Britain. So the solutions that we look at today have to be rooted in global justice. They must be restorative and they must include some element of reparations which takes me on to the things that I think would excite Schumacher were he with us today. I think the most exciting things that I see happening today in the field of the practice of economics are happening both at the global scale in terms of new alliances of politicians and economic theorists working across boundaries to address um, the challenge of climate and how action on the climate might best be financed. And I think they're the grassroots um, initiatives that many of which have been through with for, been with us for many years and many more of which are springing up. Um, I think that um, despite being a strident and unrelenting critic of, of the World Bank, in spite again of of the fact that Schumacher actually played quite a significant role of the thinking that led to its creation. He, um, he wrote about, um, towards the end of the Second World War, he wrote about the need for a, a stabilizing financial architecture. Unfortunately, the, the vision that he had never came into being, but I think were he with us today, he would be excited about um, the initiative put forward by the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, um, known as the Bridgetown Initiative, um, central to which is the establishment of a climate mitigation trust that would prompt the release of 650 billion from the International Monetary Fund through the issuance of special drawing rights, um, in essence, um, low interest loans that are currently only available to um, the global north and to make those available um, to allow um, a broader range of members to borrow one another's reserves at low interest rates, um, which um, Mia Motley believes and her advisor Avinash Pasord believe could begin to raise the kinds of capital needed to get us on track to stop global heating. Other elements include giving climate vulnerable countries access to low interest long term loans for adaptation and grants for loss and damage that would be funded by a 2% tax on fossil fuels and um, exports, which would shift the burden of um, paying for the climate crisis from the poorest people in the world directly to the polluters. And Schumacher would also have been supportive of the many initiatives relocalizing economic activity and rebuilding community. Uh, so from um, the folks building a cooperative economy in Corporation Jackson in Mississippi, through to um, Kate, the, the way in which Kate Rayworth's donut economics has, been, has taken off around the world, through right the way through to um, Paris Mayor and Hidalgo's um, vision for a 15 minute city. I think all of those things um, would have excited Schumacher. And small and appropriate scale activity is on the rise all around us. And that matters. And I think this speaks back to John's point about metaphysics is it matters because it enables us to see interconnections in ways that big just can't. Um, and that matters because of the particular nature of the challenges we currently face. 
Recognizing the challenge of climate breakdown means that we must recognize the interconnectedness of all things, because that recognition of interconnectedness brings obligation to respect nature, to build regulation um, that is restorative, um, to put in place international treaties that protect, to build resilience through to community, to rapidly and urgently reverse inequality, to limit the freedom to make private profit in the name of well-being of in in the name of the well-being of all um, for life on earth. So if we put that form of restorative um, regulation in place, I think we can further spread the great flourishing of small, local, open and connected forms of organizing that are already underway. Um, and as John pointed out, we're living in a time of urgency. So can we get there in time? I, I'm not sure um, that any of us can tell. Um, but perhaps in that we can draw on the advice of the speculative fiction author Octavia Butler. In one of her essays, she recounts an exchange with a young man who'd um, asked her what the answer was to ending suffering in the world. Um, okay, the young man challenged, what's the answer? There isn't one, she told him. No answer. You mean we're just doomed? He smiled as if he thought this might be a joke. No, Octavia Butler said. I mean, there is no single answer that will solve all our future problems. There's no magic bullet. Instead, there are thousands of answers, at least, and you can be one of them if you choose. And I think that's a kind of spirit that both shined through Schumacher's work and inspires us all today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Um, excellent. Um, Finally, today, uh, we're going to have Stuart Wallace. Uh, Stuart is uh, currently the chair of We All, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, the leading global collaboration of organizations, alliances, movements, and individuals working together to transform the economic system into one that delivers human and ecological well-being. Previously, he was the executive director of the New Economics Foundation for 12 years and the international director of Oxfam Great Britain for 10 years. Um, so welcome, Stuart. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Matt. And like John and Ruth, I'm very humbled to um, be taking part in this and feel very moved as well by what um, both John and uh, Ruth have said. Um, I think they've covered a lot of tremendous ground about Schumacher's thinking. Um, I felt Schumacher's influence most in two places. One on visiting um, the Schumacher Center and spending, like John, the night in the library, uh, several nights, I think I've, said, I've slept there several times. And secondly, on a couple of day long train rides with George McRoby, who Ruth mentioned, where we had such a laugh that I felt the presence of Schumacher, George McRoby was one of his uh, best friends and he carried on his work after Schumacher's death in, um, with the Soil Association, with the Center for Medi Intermediate Technology, etc., And it was wonderful to come back and reconnect with Schumacher. And as Matt has already said, this is my copy I bought 49 years ago. So it was one year after it was published. And it was just at the time I was going to London Business School. And the two just didn't connect at all. I was listening to, you know, London Business School, I was hearing the economics and business of um, the capitalist world. And yet I was reading this and it stayed with me and really accompanied me all my life. And it's changed my life because it took me to, um, first of all, to Oxfam bid career when I um, took my salary down by two thirds. Um, and my well-being up by millions. And then secondly, to the New Economics Foundation, and then, well, laterally, to the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And if we just look coldly at the economic system we've got at the minute, I always characterize it by the four U's. It's got four interlinked and systemic problems. It's unsustainable, it's unfair, it's unstable, and it's making so many people unhappy. So at one level, it, and when we look what's happening in the geopolitics as well, things look pretty dire. 
But this is where Schumacher comes in, because when I first read this book, one of the many things that moved me was his insight that a Buddhist economy, as both John and Ruth have referred to already, would be the exact opposite of how our economy is currently run, of a Western economy. And as has already been said, it'd be an economy of permanence based on renewable resources and where growth is only of any value up to the point where people have sufficient to meet their basic needs. And beyond that, it would be dis growth was disastrous. He said that 50 years ago, and we've seen the fruits of that in so many ways, what's happened. But I also loved the fact that, it, as Ruth has said, it was bold and it addressed the really major questions, the fundamental questions of what the economy is. Who is it for? Um, and what's its purpose? And, you know, he talked about an economy that is and was for people on the planet. Now, this will sound nuts after what I've said so far about the state of the current economy, but I actually do feel more optimistic today than I ever have in the last 50 years that Schumacher's ideas are actually going to be implemented at scale. And I'm going to say more about that because I think that's a bold thing to say. It can be thought of as Pollyanna-ish. I hope it isn't. But why do I think that? Because I think both the what and the how, what type of economy we need to move to and the how are much clearer and they're happening. So I see real evidence of change. Let me start with the what. I think a bit like uh, Ruth and John have both pointed to, there's a growing consensus about what the economy should deliver and for whom. And it very much fits, all these things fit with Schumacher's ideas. We work with a whole range of our members across the world in the Wellbeing Economy Alliance to come up with a list of what we call needs, the, the fundamental human needs that need to be, the economy needs to meet. And they start with the idea that everybody should have enough um, to live in comfort, safety and happiness. So it's about sufficiency. Secondly, the idea that there should be a just distribution, not just of income and wealth, but fundamentally of power as well. Thirdly, that the economy should be locally rooted where people have a, a say in their economy and a sense of control over it. Very much the same things that Ruth has been talking about. And that all the institutions, our businesses, should be serving the common good, which is this type of economy. And that they should be creating real value. And that sense of real value speaks to what Ruth was talking about, about the economy of care. Who are the people how, that are creating value and how do we measure it and how do we see it? So we've got the very wrong idea of what value is um, in the measures we have in the economy now. And lastly, and perhaps above all, an economy that operates within local and global ecological limits and regenerates back to what both of them have been talking about and reveres the natural world. It's not enough to talk about sustainability anymore. We've got to be talking about regeneration and revering and living um, in reverence for our world. And I think there's a growing understanding amongst all sorts of parts of the world about these types of goals. I think also um, there's an understanding that the economy should be designed to get it right first time. We spend at least 20% of gross national product, not even that's not the right measure, fixing and failing to fix the problems we've, the economy has caused in the first place. That's crazy. It doesn't make sense to do it that way. So prevention and pre-distribution, uh, which means paying people enough, it means totally different types of enterprise and organization. Those types of ideas are growing rapidly in terms of acceptance. And there's also, I think, growing clarity on the types of policies needed to achieve this type of economy. And that type of economy, all those things I've been talking about fit so closely with what Fritz Schumacher was saying all those time 50 years ago. And we need to do policy making very differently. Now those goals and needs, as both Ruth and John have said, they aren't new. They're 
part of indigenous wisdom of the centuries. They appear in the texts of many faiths. And when you, and vitally, when you talk to people across the world about what they want in their lives, this is what you hear. You hear these things. So these are rooted in something that's been around for centuries. But what is growing is the level of demand for these, this type of economy, the level of awareness, the level of agreement, and the willingness to act together to get it. That's the change I see. And it doesn't matter whether you call it a well-being economy, a donut economy, um, a degrowth economy, a regenerative economy, um, or Ubuntu, or Buen Vier. They're coming up with similar goals, similar values, similar principles. And so there is a growing sense um, of agreement about what is needed. And secondly, what I think gives me the most hope, though, is that many of the conditions are in place now for system change. When you look at major system changes um, in the past, whether they're in the economic sphere to Keynesianism in the mid 20th century in many countries, and then to neoliberalism in the late um, 20th century, or whether you look at big changes like um, civil rights movement, anti-slavery, um, going back further, some of the things that are needed, you don't just need, you need really good research, you need really good campaigning, you need really good uh, lobbying, you need lots of exemplars on the ground. But in addition to those things, what system change says, you need not only to take advantage of the crisis, and goodness knows we've got enough crises to take advantage of now, which is what John was referring to when he was saying why the demand for change is growing, but Critically, you need to create new power. Power is fundamental, and that requires radical collaboration. And it requires radical collaboration across sectors, across levels of the economy, and across geographies. And that is fundamental, as is telling a new story, a new um, narrative that actually speaks to who we are as human beings. There's lots of false narratives out there and populists have used them very successfully, but we see the growth of a new narrative that says we are part of nature and we depend on it. We are the economy. We're not something separate to the economy. I see that growing, though it's got a long way to go. But when we come back to this question of, uh, of a growing level of radical collaboration, just to take the example, and it's just one example, I believe there's now the, a lot of the factors that are needed for a new um, movement for a different economy globally. That's coming in place. And for instance, just in the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, um, we've seen 350 global organiza organizations based globally becoming part of it, thousands of individuals just in a short time in four years. We see growing national or regional hubs growing up in about 20 different places, some with their own um, staff and directors already. Um, six governments, and Ruth was referring to this, um, the wellbeing economy governments, um, which include New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, um, Scotland, Wales, and most recently Canada, are collaborating to say um, they want a wellbeing economy. Some, country, some of those countries doing a lot, you know, well-being budgeting and things um, to actually um, put in place this type of system. Others let much less so talking about it. And other countries outside that alliance, but there, there's a lot of evidence that countries that adopted this Schumacher type approach for well-being economy or something similar had a much better response to COVID, for example, because they were already thinking about and planning what was needed. They were already thinking about the well-being of their citizens, the fundamental part of their economy. So we can see that in many parts of the world, change is happening. People are prepared to collaborate in a different way, and it's clearer what's needed. And so I do feel much more optimistic than I have throughout my last 50 years of working life since I got this wonderful book that Schumacher would see 
a lot of what's happening and as Ruth and John have also described and actually say yeah I was right but you know and I learned as, he, as Ruth has said from Gandhi from Buddhist economic from Buddhist teachers etc but this is actually now happening so I do feel I feel quietly excited it doesn't you know is it going to be soon enough don't know but it's going to happen thank you Thank you, Stuart. Um, so I'd, I'd like to invite uh, all of the panelists now to um, ask questions of one another or comment on anything that they've heard uh, from the others today and uh, have a conversation. Um, and from there, we'll also um, start to uh, open it up to uh, questions from the audience. So I encourage you all, if you have a question, uh, to put it into the Q&A and we won't be able to get to all of them. I can already tell you that this is a lot, but um, we do, and we'll, we'll try to answer as many as we can. And um, yeah, but first I'd like to invite um, John Stewart and Ruth uh, to, if you have any comments or anything you wanna ask of each other. to start I mean I've got one for you John um as the starting point um just say you, I'd like you to say a little bit more because I think it's it's so important um about how the economy is so diverging from the metaphysical reality obviously I understand about the ecological limits and I've heard you wonderfully eloquently a number of times talking about how um, the economy diverges from natural systems. But I think a lot of people would love to hear a little bit more about that. So if you could. And I also, when it comes to Ruth, I'd love, to, you know, small is on the rise. I'd love to hear a bit more about that as well. But those are just a couple from me, but I want to hear what your questions are as well. Sure, I'll, I'll be brief. I, um, uh, I was gonna make a reflection about the small, big um, debate and and maybe I'll use an example from that to try to respond to your your question Stuart um, um, and I think I think Susan once said to me that Schumacher once said if everyone was for for small he would be for big um, I don't know if that's true or not but um, but I, I know his his idea about small was more nuanced than simply small is good big is bad and I, I'll use that as an example to talk about why um, not, not, you know, I, I use metaphysical simply to expand beyond the living world because the living world emerges out of the non-living world. So the, the, the rules, the laws, the patterns and principles of how, um, how living systems work are grounded in um, uh, our, our understanding of physics. And I'm, I'm not qualified to give a talk on, on physics, but at the heart of physics, as Ruth was talking about, is the notion of relationship and everything is connected to everything. So that is true in living systems, but that also happens to be true uh, about the, the material and even the non-material uh, world that we, that we inhibit. Um, but let me make a tangible example. So, um, the, this issue of, of scale, the internet is perhaps, in my opinion, the most regenerative innovation in my lifetime. And, and the reason I say that is that a, a, a core principle of regenerative systems, meaning not a, not a desire, not a goal, not a, um, uh, a value, but a, a, descript a description of how living systems work is um, uh, that they, they facilitate um, robust circulation. So think of your circulatory system of, of, of any living body. And the way they do that, it turns out, is with a healthy hierarchy, um, think of your cardiovascular system. You know, we have two large arteries, we have lots of mid-sized veins, and we have thousands of little capillaries. We don't have just little capillaries. And so the efficient, circulation of blood in our body is, is facilitated, is enabled by this healthy hierarchy of a combination of, of, of big, medium, and small. But the big is in service to the health of the whole. The big isn't seeking to extract from 
the system for its own benefit. Um, so if I think about big business that has um, started out with tremendous regenerative potential, and by the way, circulation um, in an economy is not just material and energy, it's, it's most importantly information. Because information, again, going back to the metaphysical, is at the root of reality. Um, um, and so if we're going to circulate information in a healthy way, we need a, an ability to facilitate that. And, and the genius of the internet suddenly came up and made that a possibility like never existed before in the history of, of humanity. So the, um, the internet itself, which of course is, a, is, is not a private enterprise, but is a public good, but then the, the company called Google, which sat, sits on top of the internet and creates this incredible tool called search. I would also argue that technology is hugely regenerative um, because it facilitates the efficient circulation of information. But the problem is that we then put a very extractive advertising driven business model on top of that very regenerative technology. So this is a long way of saying, if we get clear on how living systems actually work, the, the, the principles of what makes living systems healthy, what creates the conditions for health, we would have cheered for the internet, we would have cheered for search and therefore cheered for Google, but we would have imposed on Google a requirement to create a business model that served this health of the whole as opposed to extracted from the health of the whole. And so it's just one example of, it's not that big is bad and big is evil and big will always be bad. Although I happen to have a strong sympathy for the you know power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely uh, wisdom. But, um, but you know, we need the arteries and we need the big internet and we big, need a big search system if we're gonna circulate information in a way that's gonna serve humanity. So I don't know if that helps respond. Can I just, um, just add a point to that if, if, if you don't mind me taking on your, um, your analogy of the internet? And I think, because I think it's also um, a really good illustration of why, um, why we need some form of, um, I guess what I think of as sort of restorative or regenerative regulation in order to, um, in order to ensure that those flows of information through the system that you've described um, don't get um, don't get caught up and dominated by the big and powerful actors within them. So if we're looking at the example of the internet, although 70% of users in the, of the internet are based in the global south, over 90% of the information that's on it is in one language, um, which is English. And there's a, a fantastic organization called Who's Knowledge, who are working to democratize, democratize the internet as a space to bring many more of the world's languages and many more of the world's knowledge systems. Because if we're gonna meet the challenges we face, we need that breadth of knowledge systems. And that's, I think, within that living systems analogy, why we also need those checks and balances on power and domination. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I, I would be a, a huge advocate of Peter Barnes, who's uh, on the Schumacher Center's board. His ideas of the commons that in my ideal world, the internet would be managed independently as a commons and, and Google and thousands of other companies would pay rent to use the commons. And there would be a governance system to protect the health of the commons for the benefit of the all. And it would encourage the kind of things you just described, Ruth, and I actually had never heard that. That's fascinating. That seventy percent of the information is in English. It doesn't surprise me, but I'd never, I'd never heard that. Yeah, I'd, uh, whose knowledge are an extraordinary organization. I'd um, encourage everyone to look them up. Yeah, yeah. I have a question for you, Stuart. If if we're still in the the the, the talking heads Q and A portion of this, I I actually suspect we should rush to the the, the collective's input, um, but I, you know, I've known you, Stuart, for gosh, you know, I don't know, at least fifteen years now, and and I've, you've always been optimistic, and I'm I'm heartened to hear that you remain optimistic. Um, I, I guess, um, what's my question? Um, uh, 
what what is the what what is it that you think is missing? Um, you know, the, you, you described all these efforts and the we all successes in different countries, which is fantastic. And and yet, um, it still feels to me like there we're nibbling around the edges. And so, what is what is the you know, even though none of that happened, none of that existed when you and I went to Lo or when Susan and I went to London and met with you the first time. So sure, there's been huge progress since then. And yet, objectively, factually, the chaos we're in is worse than it was when, yep. when we met. So help us, help us grasp your optimism um, in, in the face of, of that reality. Yeah. I mean, I'm human. And so I'd be dishonest so I didn't say some days I get out of bed and think oh no we, you know, I won't use the French term um, but <laughs> really. but majority of times I don't and I think you I and it's more than anything I think it's the willingness for radical collaboration because I think power is comes from people being prepared to push aside their own um you know, their, their concern about how their organization's funded or their concern about, um, you know, are we, is this bit of knowledge ours, you know, and actually say, no, we really, we don't see any way of changing things. If you look at how the neoliberals did it, um, the neoliberals used an elite power base and they had radical collaboration of the wrong sort, probably amongst sort of big business, um, major interests, um, you know, think tanks that were created like the Institute of Economic Affairs and um, all the similar American think tanks um, that came into being, you know, and the Koch brothers and, multi and various millionaires and billionaires funded those efforts. That was a very much elite power base. The change that we need isn't going to come in that sort of way. It's going to come from, you know, large numbers of individuals, small organizations, medium-sized organizations who collaborate. And it's, therefore it's the type of, you know, we we always just one little bit of what I see as a growing movement. Um, it, there's much more of that. You see, you see it in Latin America, you see it. So I see a willingness to collaborate across boundaries and across, um, sectors and across geographies and across levels because I do believe it the change we need is going to it's not just going to be um, it will be bottom up but it's also going to be top down middle up it's going to it's going to be collaboration right through the system um, and I do see that happening so it's mm -hmm. it, and, and I only quote we all because it's just one example of something that's happened quite quickly in in four years um, where a large number of people have come together and say we we want to create um the push for more ch change it's going to be power though of thousands millions of people who say who know that the system's wrong and are prepared to collaborate and what you see in system change in tipping points if you get enough people collaborating who already know things are wrong and want to do something about it then you start to get um, the rules of the game change. And once the rules of the game start to change, then some of the norms and attitudes of other people start to change and more people come along. Um, and you've seen that in those sort of tipping points in anti-smoking, drink driving campaigns, etc. We need to do that around the economic system. And, you know, I was on a court, a five hour Zoom call for my sins the other day, which was with the National Academy of Medicine and um, the US, where they're looking at how they, how both in the US and Europe, medics can be got to collaborate for economic system change. You start to see that sort of um, unusual collaborations, and the, um, you know, one of the um, hubs in We All that's developed furthest um, is the We All Scotland hub, which is a charity in its own right, and you've got there people who range from community leaders in in the east ends of Glasgow and um, some of the poorest communities in the country together with people from um, investment houses together with environmentalists together with um, faith leaders together with academics 
who are all saying we want to work together for a different economy. And it's that sort of unusual um, groupings of new power that I think are going to be crucial to getting the change we want. Where I think we're weaker, every, where I think there's a long way to go. And by the way, I agree there's a long way to go. I'm just saying there's a huge, you know, of course there is. We're no, you know, we can, none of us can look at the economy in the minute and say it's all sorted, it isn't, it's just the opposite. But the change process, you know, again, we could get those tipping points could happen quicker. Where I think we haven't really had the breakthrough, it's going to be different in each place, but I don't think the narratives yet, um, you know, the narratives about a new economy, about a well-being economy, a donut economy, they touch people's heads and sometimes their hearts, but I don't think we've come up with stories that we tell ourselves about the vision of the future which touch people's souls and um, hearts fully. And I think that's, and they're going to be different stories in different places, but I think that's a huge job, you know, I think finding those narratives and they're going to be co-created by people um, together is still a big task. And I think if we can start to get stories, you know, Ruth has already said, you know, if it had been um, about subsidiarity, the title of Small is Beautiful, it probably wouldn't have sold as well. So there's a tricky issue of how you mm. tell stories, tell narratives that are true to who we are as humans, and yet catch the imagination and talk to people's hearts and souls. I don't think we're there yet on that. Not just we all, I don't think generally um, change makers in the economic space are there yet. Sorry, that's a bit long, but that's why I feel hopeful. But I love you, Ruth. Got a mo if we allowed it, or do we need to go on to questions? I'd love to hear more about the Bridgetown Initiative because I think it's so important. That is, um, and I think it's. Uh, I think what's 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 interesting about the Bridgetown Initiative is both the well, both the the scale and boldness of its vision, the way that it is quickly um, gathering momentum and support around the world. Um, a French President Emmanuel Macron is, is due to hold a, hold a summit on it this June. Um, it's a it's a practical um, it's a it's a practical solution to the challenge of how in terms of those questions of scale in terms it's a practical solution to the question of how you get money flowing to where it's needed. I saw that there was a a question in the Q and A about why it was that that um, Barbados didn't just engage in quantitative easing, and the problem there is that economies of the scale of Barbados aren't able to do that in the way that um, nations in the global north are. So, the what the Bridgetown Initiative does is tap into um, special drawing rights, which are um, the the ability of the um, of the IMF to to issue currency against a broad basket of reserve currency of the currencies of its members and the questioner is exactly right the terms on, on which those um, special drawing rights are made available are key but it's a way of um, getting resource flowing to where it's um, to where it's needed at very low interest rates that can get the kind of volumes of, of money that we that we need to be see into the system um, in order to finance mitigation. And then there are other forms of finance. And I think this is, I guess, an echo of Schumacher's appropriate scale. This is appropriate, they're talking about appropriate forms of finance, different kinds of activity. So there's a very different kind of finance that's needed for loss and damage, which of course is a very real concern where um, for those nations on the front line of the climate crisis, um, where a, 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 um, a major climatic event can see GDP almost wiped out overnight. And we have to, as a global response, as a global community, take responsibility for that. And that means making particular types of finance available to enable um, nations on the global south to, to respond at the same time as we're rapidly um, reducing our emissions into the atmosphere and ultimately um, ultimately drawing um, drawing emissions out. So so I think um I think it's, you know, I think there is that's the kind of bold visionary thinking I think Schumacher would have been behind. And I think it's that kind of leadership um, that also speaks to some of the things you were talking about, Stuart. It's it's people who aren't waiting for 
the kind of the established leaders to do it, but are getting out and taking leadership and making change happen themselves. And I see that in uh, I see that in the emergence of Mia Motley as a, um, a a extraordinary figurehead for a really radical proposal, who is galvanizing and who is telling a really powerful story about what needs to happen. Actually, it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I see that I see that emerging in many different ways in the communities who are getting together to organise in different ways and aren't waking, waiting for change to come for those who who claim to govern us, but are getting on and making that change happen themselves. And I think, you know, I think, I, you know, I guess I have a little bit of a question for John in terms of that. You know, if Schumacher said an ounce of practice is worth a ton of theory, where does where's the relationship between that? metaphysical that education the metaphysical understanding and practice because I think there are ways in which some of that practice brings us into an understanding of our interconnectedness and I think I think we should think of the two as relational always I, I couldn't agree more and and by the way I totally agree with your analysis of the Bridgetown um, yes, uh, right. initiative I, it, it, I've described it as a workaround for our our failed or our flawed national central bank system where yeah central banks you know i mean they the central banks can't actually do what they're not legislated to do so even if they had the the wisdom and the desire they actually can't do what the bridgetown um initiative uh it, you know it is is it's proposing so it's a to me it's a brilliant workaround of the constraint that we've put ourselves in and, I, and again, I couldn't agree more. You know, it's fantastic where it came from uh, and how it came about. And and um, I hadn't heard that Macron's holding a a, um, uh, a conference on it or, or or an event around it. I think that's fantastic. Um, and also, I, I can't agree more on the practice theory and practice. Are one learns from the other. The the yeah. you spent six years doing researching stories of what we saw as the regenerative economy emergent in the real world, including Matt Stinchcomb's work, in order to develop our theory. So it's not a theory from an ivory tower, it's a practice-led theory because the innovation is happening in the real world in response to the pressures. Um, but, it, but it does need to be, um, in my opinion, it does need to be uh, encaptured in an organizing theory. Otherwise, it's random projects that don't have any coherence. So it's both end for sure. Excellent. Um, well, I know we don't have too much time left. I wanna make sure we get through um, some of these audience questions as well. Um, Ruth, a number of people were asking just a, a quick point of clarification. Do you mind repeating the name of the organization that's um, translating uh, websites from English? Uh so they're not they're not translating websites from English, but they are making content available in a multiplicity of languages. Oh, okay. Whose knowledge? Whose knowledge? Okay. W H O S E knowledge. Yeah. Perfect. And there are Thank you. For... The collective, and, and I would urge everyone to look them up. Yeah, I'm going to. <laughs> um, so just just taking a couple of questions here. Um, you know, there's. Uh, you know, I'm trying to look at ways to connect a bunch of them together and hopefully get at the answers people are seeking. Um, but um, I'm curious if you have any ideas or um, you know, suggestions for uh, a local economy that is resource constrained, that doesn't actually um, have a lot of wealth in its community, uh, but wants to actually um, start to cultivate a real, a truly regenerative local economy and cultivate new forms of exchange that aren't just tied to financial exchange. Um, you know, wh where do they begin? How do you start? Are there examples of um, communities that are, are operating in radically different ways um, and radically different economic models or, or modes of exchange? Yeah. I'm curious if you have any thoughts or reflections. It's a pretty broad question, but um, the gist of it is, you know, how, how do we build this uh, on new scaffolding? How do we build this without necessarily employing the, the tools and frameworks that have gotten us into this mess, especially at the local level? I didn't mind going. Um, I mean, one amazing community that I 
seen and spent a little bit of time with is one in Tamil Nadu in the south of um, India, where a group of um, so-called untouchables, because they were um, sort of the lower end, lowest end of the, so the ghastly caste system in India, um, basically managed to take over, complicated long story, um, some local tea plantations and set up a new way of trading um, with, with, with groups, community groups in this country. And the discussion about the trading was, we think you're, take, you're um, paying too much um, for your tea, we need to provide it to you at lower cost. So the, the bargaining was, we think you should have more each way round rather than the usual, try and get the highest price. And, they've, and it was a just trading system. But what also happened, what matters fundamentally, and Bruce has said it already, is the relationships. There was that group there for a whole range of reasons that built up a tremendous relationship of trust. And they had their own hospitals, schools, et cetera. It's about 20,000 people um, in that group, that community. And an amazing person who had worked with them and supported them. Um, an Indian NGO activist um, called Stan Zakara. Um, but the children, the hospital had very few facilities, but the premature children there, born there, were just held by other human beings from the moment they were born. They, they weren't full incubators. They had a better survival rate than some of the poshest hospitals in the world. Because again, of that human contact that, so there was a, I've not seen a community that had such bonds of trust, um, but it was starting from such low levels of um, physical assets. Um, you know, and there's no correlation in my view between um, the amount of starting wealth a community has um, and what the degree of well-being. It's much more about the degrees of trust, the degrees of mutual support, the relationships. That's what fundamentally matters. It's not the resources. But it was just a wonderful example of, gen of living and trading differently. Um, I'm sure there's many others Ruth and John could mention. Um, I mean, there are thousands. Um, uh, there are, you know, there's a whole, you know, bioregional movement um, that has been happening for you know, decades and um, uh, exemplify this. I'll just throw one out that I just learned about today for the, the, the young tech uh, wizards out there in the, in the audience. Um, the, the, you know, notwithstanding the collapse, the crypto winter we're in, there's no question that web 3.0 and uh, blockchain technology will create possibilities to do the kind of thing we're talking about on a much more rapid scale than um, than was possible without it. And I just learned about a, um, you know, there's now a thing called ReFi, which stands for regenerative finance. Um, it, it isn't the ReFi of, that I would define regenerative finance. It's a subset of it, but it does use Web3 enabled technology um, to do exactly what you're describing, uh, Matthew, is to literally construct a, a new infrastructure, a new scaffolding to, to create a genuine exchange that is not all monetized. Um, so folks that are interested in that, there's something called ReFi Villages, which is a, a new initiative uh, led by a, a young, um, uh, uh, highly energetic guy who's, who's uh, based in the UK, actually, I think. Um, but, but if you Google ReFi, you'll find probably more information than you can imagine uh, where, where people are trying to use blockchain, Web 3.0 um, technology and connect it with this regenerative paradigm, typically beginning at local place-based uh, initiatives. Um, very exciting, and I and I think uh, just one that I'd like to mention briefly is one I mentioned um, I mentioned before. But I think in terms of 
resource constrained, constrained places, um, the folks who've been organizing in um, Jackson, Mississippi, who operate in Jackson, I'm sure many of the people on the call will have heard um, of Carly Akuno, um, the main spokesperson for that group. The work that's been done there in terms of really building a regenerative economy from the grassroots up in terms of establishing a, um, a network of worker-owned cooperatives, in terms of building skills, those relationships that the um, the resources that are needed in order to become um, a, th a sort of a thriving, uh, thriving local economy. I think that work um, is really exciting and really important. And I think more, jo more broadly, when we speak about um, about, and this is not a resource constrained place, and this doesn't speak to location, but I think when we think think about one of the some of the barriers to those alternative means of exchange. Um, I think one of the barriers is is time um, and the amount of time that um, that folks spend in the workplace, people who um, not, you know, people who are forced to forced to work two or three jobs just to make ends meet. And I think what happens when we radically redistribute time is that we uh, we make possible the exchange of resources that um, that doesn't happen. Um, the, the exchange of resources, not through the conventional economic system, we make that much more possible. So the favours that neighbours do for one another, the stuff that we do in our communities that is to do with um, to do with um, enhancing and beautifying our streets, all of the, those things become possible once we open up the window of time. So all of the movements um, around the world for a shorter working week are hugely exciting in that way, because I think um, I think time gives us the possibility to engage, to opt out of that um, sort of consumer focused economy and to care for one another in kind of profound and meaningful ways. And through that, to build resilience to shocks. Uh, great, thank you. Um, just uh, one more question uh, for each of you and then we can have some closing remarks and um, I just wanted to also shout out, though, that uh, Kali Kuno will be facilitating our next conversation on February 16th in this lecture series. So if you want to learn more about his work in Cooperation Jackson, um, that will be a panel on reparations and uh, seeding a just future with Winona LaDuc and Kali Kuno and, and others to be announced. Um, but um, we spoke a lot, or John, you spoke a lot today um, kind of about this more uh, for lack of a better word, spiritual dimension to all of this work. And, and I was reminded of um, uh, points of intervention in a system, the Danilo Meadows essay about leverage points. And, you know, where do you intervene in a system? And, uh, you know, the second most impactful place is kind of on that on that mindset level, that consciousness level and the world system. And the most impactful being the fact that paradigms are just these paradigms. They're like, they can change. And uh, I'm kind of curious... And a number of the questions kind of allude to the consciousness shift that's needed. Um, how, how are, you know, and I just in your own opinions or in your own reflections, um, you know, what is the role of, of shifting consciousness and how do we, how might we um, encourage people to think differently and therefore act differently? It's a pretty open question, but if anyone wants to take it on, I'd love to hear from you all. Hmm. I don't want to let some of you guys go first. I'll, I'll, okay. <laughs> I'd love to hear what you have to say. Do you want to go, Ruth? After you, Stuart. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's how people, because I think we're talking about con shifting um, consciousness, not just, um, and we're talking about value shifts as well, because in the end, um, the ec economics, you know, back to the Greek definition, oikonomos, it's just about um, the stewardship of the household. It's about how we live together. And so fundamentally, we're not going to shift the economy unless we shift how we want to live together and who we see ourselves as as humans, you know. So we've clearly got to move behind this sort of selfish model that runs under um, a lot of economics you know the um it, it's homo economist you know the economic man it's a disaster we've got to shift from a anthropocentric to a, um, a biocentric view of the world so we have to 
and we have to shift to a post-colonial view of the world. So we, we have to shift how we see, you know, the idea that we are part of nature has to be part of the shift, that we depend on it, that we are the economy. It's not something out there as a black box. This is, so I think we need to be collaborating in economic system change a lot with many of the people that work in the faith and spiritual areas. It's not just one religion. You know, look at the um, the influence of Laudato Si and the Pope's work. That's just one area, but there's a lot of people who are looking at spirituality and uh, how we we grow as individuals and change. Sometimes there's quite a lot of those about the individual. What we need is those type of thinking, but on a community level. And there's quite a lot of good groups that are doing that. But it's going the economic system change that we need is going to be a shift in our values and that's going to come about um, by um, again radical collaboration of you know climate change movements and, and faith groups and, and um, spiritual thinkers this does need um, us to shift as a whole and there's no easy answer to that but it does keep coming back to us asking those difficult questions about who we are and why we're here and what we're trying to do. Sorry, it's not an inadequate answer, but I do believe it's part of the answer. <laughs> Thank you for that. John or Ruth, any thoughts on the consciousness shift or the spiritual dimension of economics or what we need to do? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a pretty big question. Um, I think, you know, in terms of, I think we can, you know, we can perhaps identify moments where human consciousness has shifted. I think, you know, in, in sort of in living memory, um, sort of famously, the first time people saw the Earth from space and, and saw the pale blue dot that we collectively call home um, created something of a, of a shift in consciousness. I think there are there are moments in which our our consciousness is is shifting all of the time. I think it, it was manifested in different ways, but the um, experience of the global pandemic um, both brought us into an understanding of the delicate interconnectedness of our ecosystems in terms of the spread of zoonotic diseases, but also the way that we're connected with one another in profound ways, certainly in the UK, in terms of the way in which um, networks of self-help and mutual aid sprung up very quickly and spread across the country and that lived experience of collectively caring for one another which was very quickly turned around by um by government and and you know the messaging the messaging from government changed from one of of in the uk from um stay at home and protect the NHS and stay stay save lives to stay alert, which is a kind of very individualized, the world out there is frightening narrative. But I don't think that experience of mutual aid will go away. And I think, I think, yeah, I think re-engaging with a, I, mean, I think in some ways, it's as compl complicated as consciousness shift and as simple as re-engaging with a sense of awe and wonder um, in the, extraordinary ecosystem that we're part of and the extraordinary collection of humans that we inhabit it with. John. Well so said. I'll, I'll try to, I mean, gosh, what do you say in, to a question like that, right? Um, when, when we're mashing at the, at the, at the exit. Um, but I, I guess, I guess where my mind went, um, Matt, when you asked the question was, I was I was in a um, you know kind of a workshop years ago around you know new economy stuff and and it it got a bit heated because there was sort of the call it the green group over here and the racial justice group over here and someone in the green group said well you know if we don't deal with climate change none of the rest of our problems are going to be you know we're not going to have a chance to deal with the rest of our problems and this woman from the racial justice side of the room, and they weren't literally in the sides of the room, we were in a circle, he essentially said, excuse me, the people in my community are worried about how they're gonna feed their children tonight. And unless we deal with that issue, we're never gonna collaborate around something like climate change. And the reason I raise it in response to your question is that the, I think, and, and I remember thinking, oh my God, 
do you mean we have to deal with the trauma of racial injustice before we can tackle climate change? We're doomed. And, and now I actually have sort of the opposite view, which is that if we, if we don't understand that the, um, that the climate crisis, as well as all of these other crises, have their roots in trauma, uh, and the, the way to resolve trauma, well, I don't know how to resolve trauma, that's a huge topic, but for <laughs> sure, the uh, low consciousness energy that is making this work so difficult and creating so many problems, is typically low, low energy consciousness in response to trauma. So if we don't relieve the trauma, we won't have this rate rise of consciousness that will enable us to find our way back to what I will call the reality of, of the, the magnificent universe that we happen to be a part of. Um, why don't I just leave it at that? Because otherwise I'll just keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is, this is uh, that's wonderful. And, and I want to thank you all uh, so much for your time today. Um, I'd like to invite each of the speakers just to share a very brief parting thought. It can be as uh, simple as you want, as short as you want, just uh, any, any words you'd like to leave us with today. Uh, how about Ruth, I'll put you on the spot. Um. Well, I suppose I'd, I'd like to encourage um, everyone, if they haven't, to, to um, go and find a copy of Small is Beautiful to read it, think about it, what, what it means for today, um, to look to your own community, um, to, um, yeah, to, to remember that, that sense of interconnectedness and the kind of the, the more beautiful world that we're all striving to build, in, to bring into being is one that understands as as john's just so eloquently said that the the roots of the uh, climate crisis are also um inextricably linked to so many other injustices so we we absolutely need to be finding ways in our communities um and in the ways that we have to influence and the more that we go out and have these conversations the more that we take action in our communities the more that we can bring um, climate justice to fruition and um, a more beautiful world into being. Thanks so very much. Uh, John, how about you? Well, I, I echo the, the, the uh, let's boost the sales of Small is Beautiful. Um, I, I would add to that, um, get yourself a copy of a guide for the perplexed while you're at it. Yeah, um, I agree. And, um, and then I, I guess I would I would add what I would say is just as a as another sort of um, going back to this importance of this idea of regeneration. It, it isn't just a different word for the same conversation. It is the actual process of how life works. And at at the heart of it is the magic of life, which is that if we can can learn how to create the conditions for health, for love. Um, that is the natural state of this planet, this planet, including humanity embedded in this planet, will manifest all kinds of potential that we can't see today. Um, and so we don't need to just, you know, not brush up against planetary barren, you shrink this, stop doing this, nurture this. There's magic that we can't see yet, which is the regenerative potential of life itself. And, and if yeah. we believe in that process, and there's you know, 4 billion years of evidence that it works, and, and increasingly I'm learning 14 billion years of evidence that it works at, a univer at the universe scale, um, it's a pretty good thing to bet on. And, um, and it's actually not that complicated because we understand how that process works. So let's get clear on the process, use that as our compass and get to work. Thank you, John. Stuart. Um, just a very practical thing first. I hope we capture somewhere a lot of the comments in the questions because there's some really good stuff there and I'd love to have a chance to read through, which I feel that um, I haven't been able to, but um, I hope Schumacher Center can capture that. Secondly, just, you know, obviously, go back to small is beautiful. And I agree with John about guide to the perplexed as well, because I found that very meaningful. 
but right up to the present, to this year, um, 50 years of um, limits to growth, the Club of Rome, which is a member part of We All, has published this book, Earth for All, a survival mm. guide for humanity. And it brings things up to date. There's a lot of good suggestions in there about how we manage the commons, the ideas of Peter Barnes, the ideas of um, creating a fund for humanity from those, those the sort of ideas of Peter Barnes of um, how we get rental from the commons. So have a look at that as well. It's one part of the ideas. It's you know again, but I think I would go back to the word Ruth raised, which is the essence of Schumacher, which is relationships, and the word John raised, which is love. And it can sound very unconventional to talk about those things when we're talking about economics, but they are the heart of what this is about how we live together. And just as natural systems, as John said, you know, there's so much um, power that hasn't been unleashed yet. Similarly, love and relationships where we, we, we genuinely see that we're part of the whole and one part of one system, that, that's the fundamental. And that's what we've got to move towards. And the trouble is the, you know, both the traumas that we've talked about and the way the economic system is set up as competitive, et cetera, runs against that. But that's why I come back to hope. There are all sorts of ways now that we can all be part of this change. This change is going to require, you know, thousands, perhaps millions of hearts and minds and hands. We're part of this, join it. Um, we are always trying to, we'll be spreading the US, but there's donut economy groups, there's all sorts of different groups. It doesn't matter what it's called, as long as, you know, team up with anybody where they believe that um, in the sort of values we've talked about and the types of goals, it doesn't matter whether you agree on this policy or that policy. What matters is we do, we create power together and we say to our politicians and groups, we want change and we can do it. So that's my final thought. It will happen. Um, thank you, Stuart. And um, thank you to John and to Ruth and to the Schumacher Center for putting this on today. Um, I totally agree. Um, I think uh, Schumacher writes a lot about hope. Um, I love David Orr, who was a Schumacher lecturer in the 90s, his definition of hope as a verb with its shirt sleeves rolled up. And uh, as, as a parting thought, um, I want to share a very quick sentence from, from a guide for the perplexed uh, by Schumacher, who writes, can we rely on it that a turning around will be accomplished by enough people quickly enough to save the modern world? This question is often asked, but no matter what the answer, it will mislead. The answer yes would lead to complacency, the answer no to despair. It is desirable to leave these perplexities behind us and get down to work. Yeah. And so uh, I want to thank you all as people who are doing this good work and thank you all uh, who spent uh, the last hour and 40 or so minutes with us. Uh, I encourage you all to come to this series every month, as I mentioned, February 16th. Uh, I also want to encourage you all to take a look at centerforneweconomics.org where you can buy uh, pamphlets and read uh, transcripts or watch videos of all of the great Schumacher lectures over the last 40 years. Um, so with that, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our uh, panelists today and um, thank you for coming. Thanks, man. Thank you. Well, yeah, thanks. <laughs>